Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 261. Episode dos seis uno. How are you guys doing? How are you feeling? Great. Amazing. Good to hear. Hope you guys are well. Hope you guys are all hydrated, limbered, exercise with that malarkey. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling fresh. Just had a very um, productive morning. Um, the sun is shining this morning for once in my life. The sun is coming through the right hand side of the camera here. If you're listening via the podcast, you won't be able to see it. But why are you only listening to audio version of the podcast when you can see me in full 720p HD? Switch over to YouTube. Link will be below in the little description of your podcast app. When you're when you're listening to the podcast, click the little description bit where I put my links on in the show description, and you'll be able to see a link to my YouTube channel, and you can see me in full 720p glory. But yeah, the sun is shining, so my my face is a little bit glowy today. Plus, I put on a bit more um, baby oil this morning because I felt you know, I felt a bit cute. It's Friday morning. Why not? Whilst you're all getting prepared to get wasted later on this Friday, I decided to put on some baby oil so I just feel a bit cute when I'm on my way to work, and then when I come back. I want to feel even more cute because I'm also going to have that glow on my face because I haven't drank any beer and I feel nice and snug and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> anyway, I um, hope you guys are well. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling fine. You know me. Just chilling, just having a good time. What have I, what, what's what been going on this week? Not much, in it. Not much been going on this week. It feels a bit of a slow week. I think maybe the, 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 the times are changing. People are winding down a bit, especially in where I work, you know, in the kind of marketing sector for the most part and, and mostly in terms of startups as well. Um, most of the time startups tend to have people that work in the company you know 24 7 7 days a week it's always on the front of their mind because by and large people that work at startups usually work for companies they want to work for in an area they're very interested in or they're just enthusiastic about tech so they don't mind you know giving their all to work so then when it comes to the months of october or maybe september onwards those workaholics tend to kind of you know um tend to just tend to kind of put the take take their foot off the pedal a little bit and have a little bit of an enforced break because you know they've been working hard all, all year round but if you're someone like me who kind of depends on that kind of day in day out hustle to kind of keep me motivated because for the most part you actually don't want to be there right you want to be doing this um seven days a week um professionally and be able to pay around that way it kind of gets a bit tiresome in it because you know it's just there's nothing to do man like because everyone's essentially switching off most of the people that I work with are a bit older, so they don't tend to live in trendy parts of East London. They tend to, I mean, of, of London in general, they tend to live just outside of the of the London bubble. So they travel into work. So usually they are the ones that are, are more more of, more likely to not going to leave the office earlier or take a break sooner. So they're winding down. They're trying not to have anything on their plate, so they don't have to have their laptop out on the dinner table because that's the most. I'd imagine if you have a partner that's a workaholic. And then, you know, fair enough, you give them the year to be like, quote unquote, the year, you give them eight months of the year to be, you know, away from the home, not looking after the kids too often, wherever it may be. But then, you know, for them to turn up at Christmas dinner or Thanksgiving dinner, wherever it may be, and then still have their laptop or be on their phone all the time, emailing back colleagues, you would be furious, isn't it? So furious, you might actually just fling a plate from across the table at, the, at their head, you know, split their head wide open. And when your children ask you, mommy, why do you do that? You look over to your husband and just say, he knows why. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Honestly, it's a madness. So I don't really blame them in that respect. You know, sometimes you have to keep the peace at home. But for me personally and selfishly, that's annoying, man. There's nothing to do. Honestly, nothing to do. I'm so bored. Just there sitting at work trying to get things done and nothing's happening. Nothing's moving because no one wants to do anything because no one wants to add an extra task to their plate in order for them to kind of do other things. So I get it, man. I get it. But, you know, again, like I said, for me, I wish it was the other way around. But what can you do? Anyway, um, let's move on. I've got loads of topics to run through, loads of stuff, loads of streetwear news, loads of other news to talk about, you know, the usual mix of things. As per usual, if you're listening via the podcast app and you like to you like what I'm here, what what you hear and what I'm talking about, why not leave me a five star review? That'd be great. If you're watching via the YouTube, why not smash that like button, click subscribe so you can come back another time. So let's see what I've got to talk about. Um, Cybertruck, right? Just going, um, another soliloquy about the Cybertruck. I know everyone's been flooding our YouTube channels with the Cybertruck news, but I think the sometimes on YouTube, there can be a tendency to kind of, um, you know, hype things and to kind of get a bit fanboy over things that don't really make any sense. Or some other people, there can be a trend to like kind of hop onto trends or hop onto like themes or talking points and just kind of talk them under, into the ground. And then you're like, as a viewer, you're like, what the hell? It doesn't make any sense. Who cares? But the Cybertruck, just kind of, you know, having having kind of uh, thought about it a bit more and kind of really kind of taken in all the content out there and read some of the reports and seeing Gay's reaction on social. It really is a, 
once in a lifetime thing and it and it kind of and it could be to automotive design what the iphone was to smartphones it could be that important in terms of suddenly just like changing the way we think about um cars and what we what, what we should expect from our um motor company because i think as much as people like to diss um steve jobs and say you know he wasn't that relevant and he wasn't actually the ones making the actual iphone i think of bilbo has a real famous joke about it right i think on conan where he says oh he thinks steve jobs was overrated right because essentially he just you know drove his employees to the brink of insanity in order to kind of make the phones but he wasn't the one actually making it himself fair enough but i think in most techno in most technological most technological fields you always need a lightning rod. You need a figurehead who kind of wants to push things to an extent where, you know, the everyday person or average person on the street would be like, that doesn't make any sense. Because sometimes I think the things that doesn't make any sense is the one that actually makes the most sense in the long run. And it's the kind of thing that other companies or other people can sort of build upon. Because I think even if the iPhone didn't work out, imagine the iPhone ended up being, uh, I don't know, Sony Ericsson and it just didn't take off. I think the iPhone was still as a design print or as a design proposition, um, as something to expect from a from a smartphone developer or smartphone manufacturer. Story, it still would have been the source of much in- inspiration for other companies coming forward. Because I think of sci-fi movies, I think of um, yeah, mostly sci-fi movies. Whenever you watch sci-fi movies, even from the eighties or seventies, you do always see them carrying some kind of telecommunication device that looks similar to an iPhone, right? Like a flat kind of mostly glass. Sometimes it'd be see-through touchscreen device that you could like you know i don't know analyze um, the surface of the moon with or you know take samples of you could zoom whatever there was something that it kind of had the same sort of form factor so when we saw the iphone what i think it did for a lot of manufacturers out there it finally gave them permission because i think a lot of people are like that even you know myself i kind of think i'm supremely confident in some ways but in other ways i'm probably a little bit scared of things i think it gave um manufacturers the permission to be like oh all these phones that we make, all these phones that we get um, kids to kind of design in design contests or we get our design studios to mock up prototypes, we can actually make them in real life. And it pushes you a bit further because, you know, essentially this form factor changed the way chips were developed in a, in, in a life, in well, smartphones, the way batteries were developed. Like it changed everything. This whole circuit board of the phone has changed because if you remember Nokia from back in the day, or just TVs at, at forever, they always had a brain, you know, everything you had, a te- te- technological device you had always had some kind of bump that housed all the electronics. And somehow with the iPhone, you suddenly had to shrink it, you know, bit by bit with every generation, it just got slimmer and slimmer and slimmer and slimmer and slimmer. So I think as much as ugly as the Cybertruck may be to some people, I think it's finally shifted everyone's consciousness or sense of expectation. So now, even if you're not a big Tesla fan, you're going to demand more from Ford, Porsche, Mercedes, BMW, Toyota, Hyundai, wherever they may be. All those amazing show, all those amazing cars they show you at the, you know, those trade, those automobile, automobile, um, was it exhibitions or trade shows? I think they're called, right? I went to one at XL building one. So that was really cool. Um, automobile, uh, auto, let's see, auto concept cars. Is it? Concept, let's just write in concept cars concept cars trade show let's see what we see because i do remember there just being so many i think um mercedes is actually the one that's maybe the most annoying they usually have amazing concept cars but by the time they come on the road they look so generic it's just unreal how generic they they end up looking so this is a good example of one right i think this is this is, this is just a render though uh this is the eight concept cars you want to see in the showroom very soon right this is from world world industries let's get this up here Put it here, here, put this on the screen. So there's eight concept cars, right? Number one, look at the, look, look, look how beautiful that looks. So number two, concept cars are cool, but what's the use if you can't head over to a dealership and drive one, right? So the first one, they said it will look really cool, is this, an Audi Sport Quattro 2015 release date. Audi unveiled its Sports Quattro concept at the Frankfurt Motor Show, taking inspiration from the Quattro concept that debuted at the 210 uh, Paris Motor Show. Both cars draw upon the company's legendary 1980 Euro Quattro, but this concept car appears to be more production-minded than the 2010 version. Okay, that, that's not too outlandish. This this Audi it looks pretty. It looks like something you'd make to you on the road. I love the rims. That front grille looks mean as fuck, but let's continue. This is probably a more concept, and this is, again, something that you'd want to see on the road, a Ford S-Max. Why can't they just make that? It's a Ford S Max 2014 release date is a 1.5 liter EcoBoost engine powers the S Max concept. This estimates starting car offers drives about 178 horsepower 
and 177 feet of torque. Although Ford would prefer you to don't call it a minivan, it sure does look like one. The smart concept can seat seven passengers comfortably with extra room for luggage. The car is also loaded with all the Ford's latest info, um, infontaine technology, including my Ford Touch and Sync. But again, just taking a quick look at the cars, right? Apart from maybe this Jaguar C x17 they all look fairly standard nothing really too crazy about them just your, your standard something like this is something you'd want to see on the road right this smart for joy a mercedes-benz owned city car brand uh, plans to unveil a smart car in 2014 although the for joy doesn't have a roof the tailgate or doors the car does feature smart signature uh tried and sell you can expect the car to be a uh, some forever long so this i'm not too sure if it would be road legal i'm not sure what the rules are about having a door and a, a, a roof on the car but still, just as a concept or just as something maybe to sell even to like specific markets, maybe be sunnier climates where maybe you won't be exposed to elements as much, great. But we don't see it. And we just see the same form factor, the same old iterations of cars again and again and again. So I think even if you're not a big fan of Tesla, just seeing this on the street, as someone posted this on Reddit earlier, it's a little video of, of, a, of a Tesla Cybertruck probably having a couple of tests i reckon because there's it's being flanked by loads of other teslas so i'm assuming some sort of test run but just look how how look how mean this looks on the streets and imagine what this is going to look like once everyone gets their own um once everyone gets their own model in their driveway how weird this is going to look all over the place it just looks amazing look at that. what the heck and i think that's the expectation oh, yeah. level that we're going to be expecting now. so if ford come out or if mercedes come out with just some what basic ass car you're not going to have it you're not going to be as um, receptive to it anymore and i think that's what essentially it's done so it's just a really clever branding trick or a really clever branding um, exercise because number one you've created something that's very divisive that generates loads of content free content for, for the most part you haven't paid for one bit of marketing similar to something that you know supreme would have done but in years gone by and um essentially you've also built something objectively that's quite ugly but it's also um questioned it's also made people question why their favorite car brand isn't able to produce concept cars isn't able to manufacture them for the general public it's crazy isn't it it's, it's such a weird thing to see only such an amazing thing to see and i honestly can't wait to see what they look like when they're all careering down the street again i'm not too sure I think um, there was a. Do you remember there was an era where everyone was driving white cars? For instance, everyone wanted their cars to be white. I'm not sure what that trend was. I'm not really a fan of white cars, but it would be nice to maybe see a bit more variation in terms of the actual finishes. Although I'm a big fan of the stainless steel look, it would be a bit weird. It'd be a bit dystopian to see everybody driving around in, you know, these um, stainless steel trucks. Uh, that being said, when I say everyone, maybe that that's what it will be. You know, it, even though it's a pickup truck, it might just end up being one of the most popular suvs because there is a trend especially nowadays with people driving porsche trucks lamborghini trucks bmw trucks like or suv type um, vehicles uh similar to like that this is it x5 or x6 or whatever that car is that everyone drives um and that lamborghini that all the rappers have and a few people around my area have it too especially some of the asian boys they love that car um so that that might be a thing right it's like it's this idea that because i always picture those cars just being a truck version of a luxury sports car so it's like you've, you get the benefit of driving like a porsche boxster but with a bigger sort of body i always get that kind of feeling or like a 911 if you're if you're a dude right you probably you probably don't maybe a 911 is a bit too i don't know it probably isn't the most uh, easy car to drive every day or maybe a lot of people do argue against that so maybe you that's why you buy a jeep but i don't know man. i just see what it looks like i really would do but just thinking about it i can't actually get it out of my mind actually i haven't seen it to the presentation it's one of those things that just sticks in your head you're like jesus did i see that was that real yes it was and if you watch the whole presentation i think it's like 40 minutes usually elon is rambling and ranting about whatever it is whatever it may be but this time around he just came out gave a short little introduction and boom you just rolled it out because he knew you know there's not much you can say when you just have that thing on on the stage because i'm pretty sure he, he knew he was onto something when he started um sending the design around the office let everyone know hey guys what do you think of this car and everyone's already up it's probably like this is probably ugly like proper split opinion and so i guess you knew you know straight away you're onto a winner when you do that so yeah big up those guys and i think the pre-orders keep going up and up last i checked on Elon musk's twitter i think he said they're up to two two hundred and fifty thousand. um uh the, what would you call it Re reservation so far of course they're only a hundred dollars so i think there'll be a lot of people who will probably end up flaking as per you know as per the whole facebook events uh ratio just because you have a thousand people attending on your facebook event you'll probably only get 10 percent of those turning up if that so you know we, we shouldn't take that number as gospel but still 
250,000 people putting down $100 each before the car's been even produced. <laughs> Sick. Anyway, let's continue. Let's move on. Before I need to blow my nose again, let's say if he was not having a round, is it? Okay, let's continue. Bambaratid. Bambaratid. Um, let's go. What else we need to talk about here? Da, 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 da. It's got my list. I've got loads of things to run through. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, cool. So, um, there's this interesting feature from Garant's door. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with who Garant's door is. Um, she was the ex, famously the ex girlfriend of uh, Scott Schumer from, uh, what's his flipping website called again? Oh, bloody hell. What's Scott Schumer's blogger called again? Let me know. If Let's pause that. Scott Schumann. Schumann. What's his blog again? What's his blog? What's his blog? What's his blog? The Sartorialist. You remember this guy? Yeah, that's it. Now I remember it. Cool. Oh, you changed the website. Okay, cool. So um, this interesting story about um, Gavin Store, who's the former, who's the ex, sorry, ex-girlfriend of uh, Scott Schumann of the Sartorialist website. And if you're not familiar with the Sartorialist, what the hell have you been? It's this um, obviously influential street style blog or street style vlog, blog here for the most part that um, was basically the first one around, I think, that kind of ushered in the whole street style trend. Um, most of it was, I think in the beginning, was concentrated around the editors who surrounded the magazines and stuff, but then he kind of took a little bit of a detour and started to profile all, this, all the people that kind of surrounded the fashion scene. Then it kind of spilled out into just him visiting loads of beautiful places, mostly in Italy and France, and just kind of capturing everyday people and just taking, you know, kind of, focusing on some of the details of the outfits that could potentially lead into other trends or just other interesting ways to wear particular items whether it be scarves overcoats knitted tops uh heels just a really cool um mood board of loads of different kind of um street style pictures from all over the world right just an, an, an all-in-all dope dude and at the time i remember scott schumann and garen Stoll were a pretty cool power couple or it couple in fashion um Garen Store had her own little lane that she was kind of doing a little bit more artisanal, I would say, a little bit more boutique, um, a little bit more niche. And then, you know, Sartorius seemed to be the one, you know, Scotch into one smooching with all the kind of higher ups in the fashion scene. And obviously they split and she went on to do other things. She set up a sort of studio, had her own little magazine that she did. But if you look at her online magazine, which I think is Garen's Door, just Door, I forgot the name of it. Let me just see if I can, if I can find it, actually. So Garen's Door... Matt blog what is it called again i haven't been on it in ages though okay we are we are door right and it's like a it's like an online lifestyle sort of like magazine mostly um concentrated towards women and when i used to read it i don't read it too often because you know most of the most of the articles don't really have any um don't pertain to me or have any kind of relevance to me in that regard but it's always good to kind of check in and see what she's doing it it seemed as if it was mostly um focused upon lifestyle and just upon career stuff health and wellness and it was less so about the kind of quote-unquote traditional trendy fashion sort of stuff it seems like she kind of moved away from it i got the feeling anyway in general but it seems like a natural evolution i guess if you have spent that long in fashion especially you know sitting on front rows and just you know i don't know taking you know the gifts of like bags and scarves and you know um, discounts off the line whatever it may be in the showroom it gets to a point when you get a bit older where you know you need to make some money you need to pay rent you, you want to raise a family you got a dog whatever it may be right so you need to kind of like move into other ways other avenues of revenue streaming I'd, I'd imagine the fashion media landscape isn't as um fruitful as it as people like to like it like you to believe especially if you're somebody of any kind of notoriety or influence there's only so much money that's probably going around those the same amount the same five or ten people so she kind of broadened her her audience broadened her scope kind of invited loads of different women to sort of kind of guest blog on her online magazine i guess um there are some cool features on there where she kind of profiles people and their careers and what they get up to i think this one here at the top is probably one of them um and it's just kind of a real holistic view and it focuses on the entire person um you know those kind of websites that you get for the most part that sort of focus on creative um artistic entrepreneurial types and kind of you know i'm trying to have a little peek into what they do their everyday life um motivation career direction whatever it may be just cool stuff this lady's apartment's bloody beautiful who is this woman claire marie rutledge wow so yeah really cool and inspiring stuff so anyway that's enough about gang store overall 
So she gave a, she gave a really cool interview or she gave a really cool um, talk at the Business of Fashion Voices um, conference that happened, I think, quite recently, where she basically detailed why she essentially quit Fashion Week and why she fell out of fashion overall. And I was surprised to see the title, but then once you read the article, it kind of makes sense. But it sort of, it sort of explains why I kind of felt, especially kind of watching her from afar, it kind of felt as if she was pur- pur- purposely moving away from the quote-unquote uh, fashion world, especially the front world world, and kind of just focusing more on just... Um, a career in those artistic endeavors as opposed to kind of sitting in the front row because i've always long argued i think that's one of the reasons london kind of gets held back a bit and some of the talent that we have kind of gets wasted because i think a lot of the kids in the fashion universities i think they are more enamored or more kind of you know um they're more drawn in by the idea of being involved in fashion primarily due to what they see on the front row or what they see on the runway and I think fashion in general or any kind of creative artistic field, there's a bigger business in and around it or a, a behind all of that nonsense. I think the, the runway and the fashion shows are one side of fashion, but there's other bits that you can kind of get involved with. I look at it in the terms of like, you know, a really cool vintage boutique sometime. It's a good example. I'm sure when St. Laurent popped up, vintage boutiques went through an entire renaissance, right? Because essentially you could get that St. Laurent Heidi Semaine look at vintage shops. But then there are times when vintage shops are not in vogue anymore. People want to buy quote unquote new clothes. So to be the kind of vintage shop owner and to just kind of do that really well and to have your little boutique somewhere where you buy really well, you have fairly, fairly, uh, fairly fair prices, you have a really cool, interesting, diverse cast of staff members, you have a really good social media game and just be doing that year in, year out outside of the whole fashion bubble is what I see as a quite um, achievable target for a lot of people as opposed to kids in universities aiming to be the next John Galliano, which is, you know, reserved for the 1% of the one percenters. Um, there's a, it's like a professional football, it's the same sort of thing, right? Um, instead of kind of trying to focus your efforts on trying to become a professional footballer, why not try and, if you're interested in football and you want to be involved in that world, why not try and become an agent? Why not try and become a coach, uh, a recruitment analyst? Um, a PR person, marketing manager, something where you're still involved in that world without being on the front lines because that well, that side of the industry is is kind of something that you can probably do for a longer time than it, you know, you being the star player, especially in the football world, right? You're only, what, you probably got a 20 year a 20 year career for the most part, right? 35 is probably when most uh, footballers retire. So I'd imagine the same sort of thing happens in fashion. You know, there's only so long you can become, you are the cool it one, especially on the, on the front row circuit. So anyway, she detailed this whole experience in this article featured on the Business of Fashion. I'll quickly read through. It's titled as following. Uh, I'll put it in the show notes as well for you guys to read if you want to check it out yourselves. But it's titled... Why Gareth Stowe quit fashion? The famous illustrator and street style photographer explained why she abandoned the front row stage of BF of the Prince of Fashion Voice. Oh, yeah, I've got to say she was a photographer too, so or still is a photographer. Um, so Oxfordshire, United Kingdom. Gareth Stowe knew something was wrong even a decade ago. In May 2010, she was at the height of her power in the fashion industry. Renowned illustrator and popular street style photographer, whose images trendsetters like Carleen, sorry, Carleen Whitefield and Caroline Issa were becoming increasingly influential thanks to the rise of social media oh, and those two man especially Karen Royfeld during the whole Vogue Paris tenure and when she left she had probably I think Karen Royfeld might have had the best peer the best sort of like post uh, editorial uh, ed- editor in chief uh, breakup outfit run when she left or when she was ousted from Vogue Paris ever I think so so I think they even I think that whole Vogue Paris series when uh, Karen, Karen Warwickfield ended up falling out with uh, Emiliana Emiliana Alt right that's a woman they kind of fell out they're not friends anymore due to that whole conflict uh, Caroline Issa obviously has been you know she's been smashing the looks all in but that Karen Warwickfield era just after she left uh, Vogue Paris before she launched CR Fashion was epic man some of the outfits that she had on Mamma Mia just amazing <laughs> If ever there was a way to kind of like, if ever there was like someone to look up to, especially if you're a woman in terms of an older lady who is able to look sexy without looking slutty, especially in the fashion world, especially wearing really short skirts, leather, black, everything tight, minimal makeup. Oof. Yeah. Anyway, continue. It's no wonder then 
that Dior was ushered through the airport like I was an old Lady Gaga by Dior after traveling to Shanghai, where then creative director John Galliano was set to debut his 2011 cruise collection. During the paid for trip, Dior recorded a video interview with Galliano, who at the time was allegedly struggling with substance abuse. After sensing his turmoil, she decided not to post the video, much she said to Dior's dismay. Less than a year later, Galliano was fired by a multi billion dollar company after making a public anti Semitic rants recorded by a bandstander. Again, which is really incredible. Fair play to Garen Store, because I think especially in this era, um, where you're kind of um where most it feels as if most creators live and die by the engagement or by the clicks that they get or by the views or by the likes that they get on particular posts and they will basically do anything for views. For her to kind of make this decision like, you know what, this guy's going through stuff and I'm not sure if he's actually of sane mind. Uh, so I'm not going to post this. I don't want him to look bad. Is a real good credit to Garen Store, I think. And again, she was proved right because a year later, he's seen ranting raving at a Parisian cafe. I'm pretty sure it was uh, saying some pretty anti-Semitic things, right? <laughs> the kind of thing that most comedians would get their com- comedy special counseled for, right? Um, which is which is interesting because I think the fashion world is a bit weird like that, and they don't really cancel people. You can get away with murder really for the most part, and people kind of turn the other cheek. Um, even the fact that he's maybe still got a job now is kind of evidence of it. Because I think if any other industry, I don't think he would, he would have been that fortunate. Anyway, let's continue. Uh, blah, 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 blah. For the Corsican-born door who made her name in Paris before moving to stateside, the exchange with Galliano, one of the most gifted designers of his generation, was a turning point in the way she viewed the industry. There was this discrepancy of the image of the genius and this poor man, uh, she told the audience on Thursday. It literally broke my heart. Okay, to see there's somebody that, again, it must do, innit? Imagine somebody you really look up to, especially in the, especially someone like John Galliano, right? And essential essentially he's a living legend. And to finally meet him um at the pinnacle of his career, quote unquote, um, seemingly so, and then for him to be such a broken man, um, especially after you watch you've absorbed because he's such an eloquent speaker, to see all these interviews and how he carries himself and to hear how people talk about him, to finally see him in real life and see that this guy's been beaten up and chewed and spit out by the fashion industry or by the fashion machine it's quite heartbreaking i can imagine that but it took a few years later uh for dior to come back um down to earth my fantastic love story with fashion had transferred into the world into a weird job she said she continued to attend extravagant press trips accept multi thousand dollar gifts from designers and sit front row at fashion week playing a game like every other circled influencer position so that's what you mostly get. She no one really mentions the money. So you usually get you get flown out to places, which is great. But again, getting flown out to see a Paris runway show and then not having any spending money is brutal. Trust me, I've been to Paris. It's not a cheap place to be to, especially during Fashion Week, right? Um, you have, you've got no time in between shows. You just have to pop in wherever it's open and get wherever you have to get to eat. And then you end up looking at the bill and you're like, bloody hell, right? A good indication is McDonald's in Paris. It's super expensive compared to any other city I've been to. So I can imagine... That could also kind of, you know, leave you a bit uh, dismayed as well with the industry. Um, you're getting flown to all these amazing places, staying in amazing hotels, but your bank balance doesn't really reflect your Instagram feed. Uh, here he goes. I kept taking shit, she said. Even though she was bored by the repetition of the Fashion Week cycle, the surrounding politics, by the end, people were walking to, were walking me to my seat. She recalled illustrating a key indicator of power within the ranks of fashion, an often provincial and petty industry. Years later, Dor finally broke down while getting ready to head to a Chloe show. She called Emily Note, her business partner in the lifestyle production publication of the prize Dor, and told her she couldn't do it anymore. It was then that she said, no, uh, let go of your fear of the industry, dis- discarding us if we don't play by the game. Today, Dor is based in Los Angeles and still very much in fashion. She writes about designers, works with brands on special products and relish- and relishes uh, thinking about and wearing clothes. Which is true. I think that's something that I think a lot of people, again, going back to the London scene, I think that's what a lot of kids really suffer from, especially when they're showing off schedule or off calendar. There's this idea that you're going to be ousted from the industry. No one's going to care. But I really do think, especially Gavin spoken about this cyber truck, the only way to really make a dent in the industry, to really make some noise, is to kind of be on the outside. It's to kind of uh, make your own little, make your own little, uh, make your own little scene, your own little industry, your own little ecosystem that doesn't really uh, depend on the whims and the trends of the outside in the, of, of the quote unquote general industry. I think that's why I'm so in love with streetwear. Because by and large, streetwear effectively operates on its own calendar. People drop when they want. You know, people do drop, you know, 
two times a year, mostly around the same sort of time for spring and for fall. But for the most part, you can drop your collection however you pre, however you please. Sorry, you can present it any which way you want. Um, and again, it's the it's the it's the kind of it's the kind of idea that you've created your own little ecosystem, your own little brand, your own little gang that people can, you know, mess with or not mess with. And that's where the beauty of the street industry comes from. And then when brands come to you to come and collaborate, they have to meet you at your terms. You have to meet them at their terms, which is kind of the um, the thing that I see the issue with when you're trying to be an influencer or trying to be um, an operator in that kind of world. You kind of have to compromise yourself in some way, shape or form to kind of go up there. Because again, you're coming into their house. It's their fashion house. You have to abide by their rules. Um, it continues... Uh, today Dawes in Los, Los Angeles and still very much in fashion she writes about designers works with brands on special projects and relishes thinking about and wearing clothes which is awesome right you're still working in fashion just don't need to be of fashion but she does uh, does it on her own terms that means not traveling to New York London Milan and Paris at, at least two or sometimes four times a year for grueling trade shows that Dawes believes are increasingly irrelevant to the industry they serve imagine you're an influencer and you're already flying six times a year to New York, London, Milan, and Paris. You might live in one of those cities, so it makes it a bit easier for one place. But you're not even a designer, and you're already flying six times a year, not including all the times you have to get ready, which is quite mentally taxing. You have to decide what outfit to wear, what you're going to post. Are you going to bring a photographer or not? Uh, are you going to get your you know, your whole um, skincare routine done? Uh, do you have to buy some other bits and pieces? That stress, that you know, uncertainty, who you're gonna, who you're going to stay with, who you're going to hang out with. You've probably got a place to stay. And you're not even designing the clothes. Imagine what it must be like for an actual designer, a stylist, a makeup artist, fashion director, uh, publicist, PR, that's actually involved in the running of that brand, the, the showroom assistants. It must be absolutely, it must be torture to do that all the time, season in, season out. And you just kind of rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. No wonder they're also highly strung or stressed out all the time, man. Mamma mia. Um, Dor thinks Fashion Week is the least interesting place to, today for the brand she works with to invest in their resources. I don't look at Fashion Week. Uh, this is not where I place my finger to fill the pulse anymore. She said the world has changed and it's flat again, which I agree. With. I think for the most part, you know, I think Fashion Weeks are still a good, um, like the movie theaters, I think they're still a good way to kind of present your work. Um, they're still probably the best way to present your work. I still think whenever you see Paris Fashion Week come around, I kind of equate it to Champions League football. That just happened this week. Especially if you're a fan of the Premier League, you do see a, a jump in quality, uh, a, you know, in terms of the team, in terms of the players. Everyone's really good when it comes to Champions League football. You make one mistake in defence and the, and the opposing team, they capitalise, they score. All of a sudden, you're 1-1 one, one down. You're one, it's a 1-0 draw. You're 1-0 down or, or you're 2-0 down. Yeah, that, that's how quickly a game can change and I think you see that a lot in Paris Fashion Week you definitely see the levels jump up a bit because it goes from Milan to Paris I'm pretty sure and Milan for the most part it's quite you know it's quite um, it's quite safe quite dry it's quite brown it's a bit you know meh and then suddenly you go to Paris and all the a star players are, are in operation all the big brands all the best talent are showing out consistently in in out in out and that's essentially where most of these high street fashion brands are going to kind of quote unquote um take inspiration for the brands in order to kind of you know dilute it down into a big chain so it does operate as essentially the touch point but i think if you want to work in fashion if you want to actually work with brands who are actually selling units and actually sell to the common you know everyday folk and you want to live in that world and you still want to have an, you know, you still want to have your day to day be surrounded by going to a studio, feeding fabrics, consulting on fabric swatches, um, you know, whatever it may be called or collaborating with brands and giving insights and taking part in uh, focus groups. You can still do that outside the fashion industry. And that is a big part of the fashion industry, because, again, like I said, I think the fashion weeks are like 10 percent, if maybe less of the fashion industry altogether. So I wish more kids would see that. And kind of carve their own little lane outside the industry so that we have a bit more of an uh, interesting scene because at the moment it's just a bit you know it's a bit man you need something else to shake up a bit but yeah um interesting topic or interesting interview with garen store i think maybe um i saw brian boy was a bit um put off by this i think if you're an influencer who sat next to her you might think a, a bit of a front that she essentially is saying that you're not interesting people and she was a bit bored by their presence and stuff but i don't see it like that i think 
the influencer thing, even if you're a brand boy and you're still posing in expensive garments now, you're really about that life. Like you're still, if you're still, if, if you're a brand boy and you're still doing the whole fashion week thing and getting a haircut and wearing expensive clothes and spending your rent money on a, on a really nice um, Saint Laurent uh, jacket, whatever it may be, then you're really about this life and you deserve to be where you are. But I also think if you're a garment store and you decided, you know what, after doing all of that, after being in the at the apex of the influencer mountain, now to decide to go and do your own thing, you know, somewhere else and outside of the fashion week schedule and, you know, working with brands, having your own little studio, running your own little fashion consultancy brand. I think that's cool too. You've both seen different sides of the industry. You've both been in it for long enough to decide what you want from it. And the brand boy is happy to pose around in clothes and be flown out to exotic places and witness stuff front row. Fair play, do your thing. But also I think it's cool to see someone like Garen Store step up and say, hey, Fashion Week isn't always cracked up to be. Look at what I've done. I've also been able, and I've seen both sides. I think that's also appreciated for the kids because sometimes it can be hard to take that message of like, oh, you don't need an industry from a guy like me that's not involved, right? It could just sound like I'm bitter. Do you know what I mean? But if, you, if it's from someone like Garen Store who's been to the apex of the mountain, you're probably going to take more note of it. So yeah, definitely check out the article. I think it's really, really interesting, really, insight, really insightful and really illuminating into you know how difficult it must be to be an influencer you know what i mean six times a year to fly to new york milan paris like whew, not including all the stuff that you do regionally or you do in your own country whether it be like you know freeze art fair all that sort of stuff like bow me it's amazing man amazing 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 levels of stamina that's what maybe someone should start in it some sort of health food some kind of um supplement company aimed specifically at uh, influencers especially during the whole uh uh, fashion week or you know um, yeah mostly during the whole fashion week calendar schedule right <clears throat> oh, that'll be funny <laughs> anyway move on moving on moving on up moving on in moving on up ba, 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 what else we have here oh uh, pray for French Montana but I think he's out now so I think this is old news but I think French Montana is finally out of hospital which is good to hear um he went for a, some kind of health scare. We don't really know what it's about. Um, I think the reason why I put it on here was just because um, I think there are there is still there is still something to be said for being an A star player or celebrity or public figure because I think there is still the ability for you to uh, for you to what I think or for you to kind of guide the narrative on your stories surrounding yourself. Like if you've got the if you've got good enough publicists, they can dictate what news gets out and what news doesn't get out. So I think the fact that we don't have as much information as we probably would have liked if you're a French Montana fan about his condition, I think also goes to speak to the level of celebrity that French Montana is. He's at that A star level where he's able to kind of have a team around him, he's able to kind of quell any rumors, make sure the story doesn't get out, and just essentially kind of keep mum about it. Because if you've ever been on TMZ, you know that those guys are able to get a hold of, you know, people's mug shots the same day they get locked up. You know, people are able to get reports on exactly what the condition of somebody is when they go to hospital, uh, police reports, sometimes even 9-11 phone calls, just insane bits of information they're able to get really quickly. So the fact that no one knows what's happening with French Montana, I think it's a good thing. It also goes to show that he has a really tight team around him. Whatever he's gone through, I also think is a, maybe a, a consequence of him being a bit more, too, too much of a party boy. I think I've kind of felt it recently. The last couple of weeks, I've been out a few times. I've had four-day hangover, especially after the whole tricks um part yeah mixed garage that i spoke about in the other podcast i'm still recovering still recovering from that night out and again that goes to show that you know sometimes i was a real big detractor when it came to the whole age thing it really annoyed me people say i'm too old i'm getting old i'm getting old but i think with the level of with the level of training i do essentially i work out five times a week minimum with the level of dieting and kind of you know the kind of con the kind of uh, attention I pay to, to things I eat, I kind of do intermittent fasting for the most part five days a week. It's no it's no surprise that when I try and party, when I try and go out as hard as I did in the past, it doesn't work because I've just I do too much outside of work or outside of my nine to five to allow me to kind of really party and go as hard as I want to. It's just too much. I would have to kind of give up working out and doing exercise and uploading a podcast at least three times a week in order to do that well and i think if you're french montana probably even it's even worse because you're traveling all the time which you know being at those high altitudes and being in airports no matter if you're tra traveling on a private jet you know your immune system is going to be affected you're going to be ill quite often especially touching and feeling different people when you go out in club nights and stuff you know kissing babies and shaking hands um also the fact that you're essentially going to be drinking for free in a lot of places right uh you're going to be maybe eating for free in some places too 
you're essentially be going to be pampered right as a as celebrity you every wish and and demand of yours will be met with a team full of enablers for the most part so it's a very precarious place to be for somebody that um, has you know unlimited resources to have people around you who also want to make sure that you are good and you're having a good time because their wage or their salary depends on it so he's a bit in the lose the situation but again I, I have sympathy for it I think we're at a kind of similar age right French Montana easy same age as I not the same bank balance but I'm pretty sure we're the same age let me double check this <laughs> French Montana age how old is he He's 35. So, yes, yeah, similar sort of age. He's a couple of years older than me, but still, man. Um, prayers out for French Montana. Hope he gets well. Um, I think he's out of ICU now already at the moment, but this article is from a couple of days ago. It says, um, bad boy rapper French Montana remains hospital after six days of intensive care unit due to a cardiac issues and nausea, according to the confirmed reports. The 35-year-old Moroccan native posted a video on Twitter yesterday showing him hooked up to a monitors in the hospital bed. Megan Thee Stallion showed up to give him support. French Montana bedside during yesterday's hospitalization, which is awesome, isn't it? Megan Thee Stallion is a great person, isn't it? She seems like so much fun to be around. I'd love to hang out and have a drink. Wouldn't ride the boat, though. I think that's a bit weird. Weird. But there's a video of her ass off this uh, with French giving them a little bit of words of encouragement, which is really, really nice. Because I can imagine if you're French Montana being surrounded by millions of people, hangers on the like, to suddenly be locked up in a hospital bed and not have any contact with anybody must be a little bit. Ugh. Do you know what I mean? All the money in the world, and you're suddenly on your bed and you're realizing, wow, I'm really on my own, isn't it? Out here. And you are really. So to have somebody like a Megan the Stallion, you know, I'm pretty sure she's busy in her own right to kind of, you know, uh, rock up and announce and sort of like pop in and see if he's okay. That's super cool, man. So, yeah, um, the article continues to say Montana's real name is um, Karim, whatever, was admitted to hospital on Thursday after experiencing severe stomach pains, nausea, and an increased heart rate. Interesting that happened. I guess, is that like a byproduct of heart condition that you'd get a stomach ache as well? And nausea, um, I'd imagine nausea would make sense, but a stomach ache too? mad how the body works isn't it you get a stomach because i know what they say thing when you get a heart attack your arm is shaking or something you have something happening and that's when you know you're about to get a heart attack so um yeah man uh, prayers up for him hopefully he's okay um it might be an artery issue because i'm sure that that little that kid from morton's right the son of the guy that founded morton's he died recently i think the pink toko founder and they found it was like a, basically he had a cardiac arrest so which happens sometimes just you just unfortunately in those regards so um, hopefully he gets better hopefully we see French Montana around for years to come. But yeah, man, um, that was a bit of a distressing story. But again, it goes to show, man, you just, you can't be a party boy forever. I I felt it myself. I can feel his pain. I know what it is to be sometimes to realize that you're maybe not at the, at your uh, peak performance when it comes to partying anymore. And you suddenly have to kind of be the boring guy who has a couple of drinks and goes home before the night, uh, goes home before the night, uh, night bus start. You know what I mean? Madness. Next one on the list here. We have a Craig Richards interview, which is a really good one. Craig Richards, a resident of Fabric and a, just an overall legend in the London DJing world and worldwide, um, went through and did uh, the art of DJing with Resident Advisor. Probably easily, maybe one of my favorite interview series out there. Uh, obviously, being an aspiring DJ myself, um, I like to kind of read up and view or watch. DJs from years gone by listen to mixes and to other stuff but the most important thing is reading the interviews from some of these icons from back in the day and, and you know you can go through the entire archive of RA and kind of read up on all the interviews from all the past DJs and it's always a good insight into how they kind of manage um, collect or picking and collecting tunes um, how they approach their DJ sets their views on the industry and just overall just amazing stuff and I've got some bits of the interview here that I think were really of interest to me that I'm going to pick out here for you guys let me quickly just get this up on here before i put this on there let's get this back there and there one bit that i really liked was um craig just spoke really glowingly about the man the myth of the legend ricardo villalobos um who i finally enough discovered i think because a friend put me onto him didn't he i'm pretty sure a friend put me onto him so a friend kind of put me onto ricardo villalobos and since then you know i've been the i've been that fanboy that's kind of always uh, checking um, YouTube for recently uploaded videos of Ricardo Villalobos playing, I don't know, at Sun Waves or whatever it may be. And through him, I discovered Radu, Raresh and Zip and all these kind of dudes. So he has been my sort of introduction to a whole bevy of artists. But Ricardo just um, captured my, my imagination just because I think, especially when I first got into DJing, it kind of felt a bit robotic. When I first got into it, it kind of felt as if like people I was following were a little bit robotic and stale. I didn't really have much personality to them. And once you see Ricardo Villalobos play behind the decks, you finally get to see, oh, okay, 
you see that you know people like him, people like DJ Harvey, uh, DJ Hell, uh, Ron Trent. You can finally get to see that there are personalities involved in uh, electronic music or dance music or techno, whatever it may be, right? There are personalities that come with this music, really unique characters, quote unquote DJ rock stars for the most part, and not in a kind of cringy EDM way with fireworks and pyrotechnics, just in the way they carry themselves, the way they put records down, the way they mix, um, their confidence, their charisma, just amazing people. And Ricardo's one of them. And Craig Richards loves Ricardo as much as anyone because he's played back to back with him several times, extended sets sometimes at Fabric. And that's what he said about Ricardo in this interview. Uh, the interviewer asked him the following Do you remember your first time you saw Ricardo play? And Craig Richards says the following. Yes, um, he's a very different character. He's an incredible DJ, someone who I'm very happy to call a friend. We're in a similar generation. We have a similar record, so it's very easy for us to play together. In terms of character and personality, he's a unique force in the way he plays records. In the right situation, at the right moment, he's unmatchable. I think, and impossible to fathom. The way he puts music together, another incredibly impressive thing about him is the amount of, of music, of his own music he's playing. I played an after party with him recently in Ibiza. I think he played, it was almost all his own music and almost all unreleased and unmastered. His music in some cases made just the week before. For any moment when you're hearing him, you're hearing the product of his creativity and at least half of what he's doing is on his own. It's an incredible thing if you're trying to make your sound your own and half of it is stuff is actually stuff that you've made. And that's something I've realized a lot about people who are at the apex or people that are like the A-star players in their game. They all have this insane work ethic and drive that's just like you know a standard thing for them you think of someone like a future who everyone always says has like a, a bazillion songs in his hard drive he has a million albums he can release tomorrow there is this idea that sometimes you have to kind of uh there is this kind of notion out there that you have to kind of be quality over quantity you can sometimes water them you can cut sometimes um what's that thing called was it water you put it down, water in the market. You sometimes flood the market with too much material. People get bored of you. Um, there isn't any kind of, um, you know, idea of picking and choosing the best things in your collection. And sometimes I think people can get too much hung up on that because you end up trying to be perfect, which you're never going to be. But I think especially in the DJ world, especially in the world where you're playing essentially other people's music, I've always kind of prescribed to the idea that you should be trying to educate yourself in all types of genres in just as much as you can, but also trying to put out so much stuff like content wise and I've, I have, I'm definitely someone that hasn't taken that advice myself but reading this interview has really made me kind of reconsider what I'm doing now you really have to put out a lot of stuff like mixes all the time loads of edits and just constantly kind of putting out content just for the sake of it and I think I want to do that now going forward I have to I have to do that um if someone like Ricardo's doing it it's something that you have to kind of pay attention to isn't it and talking about Ricardo I think the first kind of video that kind of um, gave me uh, my love for Ricardo, one of the first videos, it might have been a video that I kind of saw from Fly909, I'm pretty sure, from back in the day from maybe Ricardo at um, Love Box or Love, no, Field Day, I forgot the thing, what is it? Let me see. Uh, Ricardo Villalobos, uh, Love family park i'm pretty sure that's the first one i saw I'm pretty sure of ricardo playing yeah mate this this was the first one i'm pretty sure that this was the one this is from ricardo right i love boxing i think he's hugging everyone behind the decks this is just the, the epitome of what ricardo means to the electronic music space and um, so big up uh fra 909 or fra 909 um a legendary uh youtuber who's kind of put loads of videos out there from loads of different um, events all over the world that we weren't happy glad we weren't able to attend ourselves this is what video that goes in this is Ricardo playing at where? Love Family Park in 2010. So this is probably the time that I first discovered uh, Ricardo. So 10 years ago or so, right? And that's Magda there at the back as well. Love Family Park, I'm sure you guys are aware of. Here's him drinking straight out of a bottle of whiskey. Love Family Park, if you guys are familiar, is the legendary uh, outdoor um, open air festival in Berlin. It ran, I think, was it maybe for close to five years or maybe less? I forgot. At one time, they, at one point, they had like a million people turn out. Obviously, you know, due to um, safety concerns, whatever it may be, they had to cancel it over a period of time. But it was a legendary seminal place. Um, again, you know, an open air party or festival with, you know, over 100,000 people dancing and, you know, shaking and driving to flipping electronic dance music is amazing. I'm pretty sure the guy with the ponytail here is Svenzvar brother no is this ricardo's brother someone's brother this guy is you always see him in videos popping up i think he's their manager agent or something but yeah just incredible scene so 
But yeah, this is when I first kind of discovered Ricardo, right? And I'll just probably skip it a little bit ahead. You just see him playing Benedict and how charismatic he is. He's such a cool dude. Obviously, he loves, loves a hug. He's a master of the hugs behind the decks. He's got the best deck, deck, um, hugs behind the decks game ever. And that uh, and the mixing style when he kind of switches channels is something that I've tried to replicate myself with that DJ. It doesn't work the same way, but his channel, his channel switch is just oh, so beautiful, man. He doesn't use a crossfade. He just goes dum, 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 dum. like just epic, 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 dude, man. It makes me smile just thinking about some of the times I've seen him play, man. Let's put it here. Let's go. That mix. Look at him. just absolute boss, man. Absolute boss. Loads of claps and hoolering. Look at this. This is this is this is essentially kind of what I kind of think about when I hear. Um, I don't know what drum bat patterns this is, but this 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 makes me think of Ricardo. This is essentially the really good version of Tech House, not the kind of de- no nav stuff you hear nowadays. But this is what I think of when I hear when I hear when I think of Ricardo. I think of this sound. This. Sort of like early Nina, but she's sort of changed her kind of sound now. It's probably a bit more acidy, but stuff like this. So good, man. So fucking good. Big fan of his, man. Big, big fan of him. Love this guy. Anyway, so Ricardo, um, Craig Richards loves him as much as he as much as much anyone, so good, cool to see that. Let's go on to another bit of the interview that I really thought was interesting I want to speak about now. Get off the screen. What's the other bit I wanted to speak about? Uh, oh, the small gigs one. That was, that was a really cool one. So he's, he's talked about small gigs. I thought this quote was really interesting. Mm, let's see if I can find it. There we go. So this is something that I've kind of spoke about beforehand, but it's cool to see somebody a bit bigger who you know is a bit more famous say it because <laughs> obviously it gives me a bit more weight so there's this there's this um question or one of the last questions here at the bottom uh so it sounds like you got captive audience so it says um craig richard says the following one thing i've always been aware of is the is continuing to play at small gigs and not outgrowing your gigs which is what sometimes managers and agents seem to suggest you should happen as your career grows you outgrow your gigs and there's no need for you to do them anymore I don't agree with that at all. It's really important that you don't outgrow your gigs in scale and in terms of your wages. If you're going to play a small gig in Eastern Europe or in a small gig in London, there's going to be less money involved. So if, as your fee goes up, you choose not to compromise your fee for the experience and for the nourishment that comes with playing at smaller gigs, I think you've made a mistake, really. There's lots of DJs I know, without mentioning names, who could do with playing the odd small place. It would help them focus a bit, which I 100% agree with. And I think that's something that I really... You really have to respect someone like a scream for. I think for as big a scream as, and for as much of a legend as he is, and for as long as he's been involved in the industry, he has still maintained the ability to absolutely destroy a room of 250, 250 people, 500 people, 1,000, 2,000, whatever it may be. But he can still absolutely tear the paint off of a tiny pub somewhere in the middle of East London, easily. Because he's played those gigs week in, week out, he still does them from time to time here and there. I'm pretty sure another big, I'm pretty sure another DJ that's quite popular on Twitter, I think maybe a Michael Bibby or somebody, one of those guys turned up randomly to someone's house party and absolutely tore that place to pieces. So I like this idea that some of the bigger DJs still have the ability to play those smaller gigs. And I think that's why someone like a Solomon, for instance, who does those legendary Abifa after parties is so good. Because I think he does so many of those he obviously plays, you know, year in, year out. His rep, sets and reps are just insane. The amount of sets he's able to play week in, week out. But I think, obviously, he's obviously an A-star DJ technically as well. But I think the ability to to be able to play after-hour parties in kind of little villas, little Airbnbs in Ibiza for like 100 people, maybe less, is a difference. The difference of playing that kind of set than there is playing to in a bar, right? It's a different kind of ambiance. That will kind of bleed into you understanding how to command the festival stage, which is kind of a hard thing to do. So I think that's something that I've been very cognitive of. And again, I think it is quite unsettling to hear him say that that some djs actually get in the industry and then their agents and managers decide to kind of pop them up into you know into the stratosphere and get them to play the bigger bigger places obviously because you know for the manager or agent they need to that's essentially where they make their money on right their 10 percent fee comes off the back of the person uh playing bigger gigs no problem i understand that but i think for a dj like myself or for most djs that get into it i would be more than happy to play at smaller venues and get paid let's say £2,000 a month to play venues that probably capped at probably 500 maybe 300 
and just play them consecutively week in week out get better and better my craft and then maybe do the odd tour around europe and play maybe the big 500 over 500 uh, capacity venues i think that is at the that is what the that is what the soul or the heart of what i imagine or what i deem to be electronic music culture is about i think the djs that play above that are the ones that are meant to be the superstars but i think the eco the, the kind of not the ecosystem but the the heartbeat of the industry of the scene are those venues that are 200 to 500 capacity i think anything else about outside of that is reserved for the kind of you know the a-listers the big people the ones that are always you know at the top of the dj list or the ones that always come out in a higher fee i think that's fine but i think the problem that we have is that we have a lot of agents and managers or sometimes booking aid or promoters who are driving the prices up of the guys that should be only playing 500 capacities and down but but for instance i think those djs would argue and say hey i guess you know i get it but there's not enough money in those gigs to make it worthwhile that's why i think a lot of that money that they try and pay the middle the kind of the second band djs to play the first band sets should be put more into those djs at the second band so that you know you have a bit of a separation so that when you go to a festival and you go to a big nightclub you go and see the big djs play for a change right it's quite cool to see that we sprinkled in with a few up and coming too but for the most part you go to the bigger dj places to go see bigger djs right and I'd, I'd imagine like i would want like for instance i wouldn't want the bird kind to turn into like the training ground for up and coming djs i'd want you to work up towards that because that would be like your champions league level that's the world cup stage that's the big s that that's the 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 final level at the game right that's where it should be and then the small the clubs should be the places where you you kind of get your training walls right you kind of you kind of take them off you kind of get better you become a local legend you know your, your name starts to ring because you are the one that's tearing it down at this little uh you know uh hole in the wall somewhere in the middle of Kreisberg. and then from there you can graduate into playing other places but again i think it's i don't know why that doesn't happen too often maybe again it's because those middle tier djs don't want to play in a place for 300 quid or 500 pounds i get it but I don't know if that was me i'd love to do that man i'd be more than happy to play four times a, i don't know every weekend you know friday saturday at a place I pay, get paid 500 quid every every time you play and just tear it up like i'd love that that would be amazing that would be the ideal thing to do you spend a week buying tunes maybe working part-time uh mixing just engrossing yourself in electronic music maybe playing thursday and sunday even maybe not friday and saturday getting paid 500 quid to do those sets every week making your rent and just living life, do you know what I mean? That'd be amazing. Anyway, the quote continues. Um, one great thing about playing very big places is the crowd is so vast and it becomes anonymous. It's just a sea of faces. It's just uh, a case of concentrating on the mixing and the selecting and just getting it right and not making any mistakes and just doing a good job. In particular, Sona. It's like over 10,000 people. Yeah, Sona was the one, I think, for me, that made me, um, that, that, that finally made me, that finally made me say, I, I don't think DJs are made for festivals in that way. In that, you know, those not not festivals like Junction Two, where they essentially electronic music festivals, which they kind of design a bit different. But I think if it's like an indie festival with bands and rappers and stuff on stage, it's not going to work with a DJ. It just doesn't work sonically or visually. Just not the same thing. Having a guy just stand behind a decks mixing just doesn't work the same way especially when after you've just seen the arctic monkeys completely destroy for an hour and a half right i mean it just doesn't work you kind of just you it kind of pales in comparison um so i think but again the money must be so good for these DJs to play at sona and things i get it but i think if i'm a music fan i wouldn't necessarily go to a sona to go and see uh craig which is dj i'd go there specifically to see a band and if i happen to bump into ricardo or craig which is cool that, that's a bonus but i'm not going there specifically for them um so it continues here. So I certainly haven't talking about the Tona. So I certainly haven't experienced that much. But if we take the Lion Lamb, the Lion Lamb on or Robert Johnson, which I've been to in Frankfurt, one of the best clubs I've been to in my life. Amazing sound. Um, pro probably the perfect size for a nightclub. If I wanted one, I'd have it probably that size. It overlooks the canal. Like just beautiful place. Beautiful. I really recommend you check it out. Um, as the opposite of experience, in a sense, it's it's no more complicated. It's just a very different experience. It's more personal, which I agree with. You've got a chance to do something different musically. Some records that you might listen to at home or that are a bit slow or delicate in a bigger room suddenly sound really full, ample in a smaller room. I always take the gig as an opportunity to adapt and to play different things. And it should be that. The idea of just banging it out and playing the same thing wherever you go seems really, really weird to me because it doesn't seem like you're stretching your legs or using your record collection enough, which I 100% agree. I think I've been guilty of doing that myself previously. Now time, well, nowadays, for the most part, every set I play is different from the last. I usually don't ever play the same tune anymore. 
I usually change the intros, change what I'm playing in the middle, change what I'm playing on the outro. I'm always trying to mix up and play new things just to kind of freshen up and make it interesting for me. And in general, too, I think it's more challenging. It, it, um, I've always, I've always said if I ever did do stand up. Um, which I was, you know, I've always kind of have a plan to end up doing doing stand-up comedy. But if I ever did do it, I would never would be the comedian that would go up on there and just have a, a set, pre-written set that I always kind of, that I know murders and do that week in, week out. I don't think that's challenging. I would try and make up new bits week in, week out and kind of challenge myself on stage just to kind of be a bit more fresh and kind of bring a bit new of a perspective on there. And also it kind of gives me a better gauge of whether I'm good at the thing I'm doing or not. Because I think if you've got a killer set or you know what works in a particular crowd, it doesn't necessarily mean you're a good DJ. Right, there's no way of gauge whether you're good or not. But I think the ability to like play a different set everywhere you play, and for it to generally go good or go quite well, and people to have a good reception towards you and have come to invite you back again, I think it, that's more of an indication that you're maybe getting better as a DJ as opposed to just playing the same set again. It can be honestly, it can be appealing. No one, I don't think anyone understands unless you're a DJ, the feeling of fright or dread that comes in your heart when you're standing behind the decks. And the song is kind of, you know, it's kind of winding down to maybe the last minute or so. And you don't know what to play next. That dread is, is frightening. Like not knowing what to play, especially when you've got like a crowd in front of you. Like, and it always tends to happen when it's a busier night. When it's a quieter night, it does, you, 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 you just, you, your mind just, you know, effortlessly picks the track after track after track. You've got no issue selecting on a new tune. The moment it's full, the moment you start to kind of garner a bit of a traction and people start to want to come out to see you play, it's suddenly the moment when you don't when you have a bit of a selection mind block or yeah like, like you don't know what to select next it always happens like that it's so frustrating uh, so i love that craig, craig just said that and again it's something that i've always kind of um um done and even now i'm at the stage now where i'm kind of you know playing at that stage where i'm at that you know 100 pounds to 200 pounds bracket of dj then i think essentially when i get the goal is to achieve the kind of 500 pound or 300 pounds or 500 pound uh bit of the djing bit especially week in, week out. I think doing it every month is probably possible, but being able to play somewhere and be trusted to play three times a week, um, oh, no, three times a month, at least at the minimum, will be perfect in terms of, you know, making sure all my nut is covered. And that essentially for me would be the perfect place to build from. Because then from there, you can kind of really hone down, um, really kind of zone in on your sound. And then from there, hopefully people see you, you get booked maybe to go to a festival and stuff. And that would be, that would be the experience that I'd like to kind of um, have in a DJ world. And that's where I kind of got in it from. I think the, all the bigger festivals and super clubs and stuff, I think that comes in later. I think there's always time for that to come in. But I think the real enjoyment of it, the real joy that I get from it is being able to travel around the world, travel around Europe and be play, be able to play these 500 capacity stadium or 500 capacity places. You know, just see the place, see the, see the environment collect different people and essentially go and kind of give them or ex you know showcase my musical range to these people that are playing so yeah cool to Craig Richard say that and um, do I have another bit from the interview that I liked as well let me see if I can find another bit that I liked as well and then we move on oh Houghton this is an interesting bit about Houghton which I haven't been to yet but everyone's saying it's a really cool festival he has this really interesting point about Houghton Festival that I've got on here let me quickly put this on the screen so um, let me see if I can find it Houghton yeah so this is a bit about Houghton so he says the following um, when I was at Houghton um, the interviewer says to Craig Richards uh, da, 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 da. when I was at Houghton I learned that the DJ booths across the festival sites were standardised so that every DJ had the same equipment that struck me as very considerate and I didn't this is something I, I didn't even know this was, a, this was not a thing um, I guess I should have been aware of this because I remember at Junction 2 for the three DJs that we saw on the main stage, or whatever that stage was underneath the bridge, they changed the equipment every three, the, every, every, each time the DJ changed over, there was somebody coming over, like a tech, technician, unplug the decks, put a new deck in, another mixer, whatever it may be, right? There were, there's always something happening. And it always struck me as a bit weird that that would happen. Why wouldn't they just have three different stations so that when the DJ rocked up, you could just turn them on and just start playing? But I guess you don't want that kind of equipment out. Maybe someone might fuck it up. Element, I don't know, just probably a, a rationale why, especially because most of the festivals have a massive table where they put the DJ equipment on. I don't know why you wouldn't just have it all out that way, but you know. Um, but it's quite cool to hear that Houghton just have the same setup on each uh, stage. I think maybe that might be because of Craig Richard's background, playing at Fabric, playing legendary back to back sets. Maybe he's encouraging that thing where, for the most part, the DJs that come and play at Houghton usually stay, for what I've heard. They just hang out and party sometimes. So maybe. You know, you might see Ricardo Villalba just floating around. He might pop up to somebody else's set and just decide to kind of play some tunes. 
um, with them back to back. Maybe that's the reason why, or maybe just just to make things easier, so that you don't have technicians running from um, ten to ten. You just have this, the materials kind of sorry the tools standardized on each booth, which is really cool. But Craig just answered the following. He said, "It's funny because I because it seems really obvious, doesn't it, that the booths and the equipment will be well appointed and all working. The glory of Houghton, if there is any, is that I'm just trying to do it properly. The sub the substandard situation in the booth is I find unacceptable, which is true. I, I agree. You know what, right? <clears throat> if a DJ like Craig Richards is saying DJ booths are un, un- uh, unacceptable imagine what he must think when he comes to see me play at the star of Bethnal or when he sees me come play at the Heathcote and Star or when I play at a, a random warehouse party you should see what I have to put up with equipment wise it's never ideal ever 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 sometimes so much so when you go and play these kind of places you're like why did I even bother downloading a WAV file here why why what's the point I could just rip something off YouTube and it still have sounded equally as good right um but again I think those are good training wars because the hope is if you can play on janky equipment when you get to a higher level, you'll be, you know, you'll be Lionel Messi behind those decks because you, you're used to playing on CDJs that always skip. Uh, the pitch doesn't work. Do you know what I mean? Like, you've never got knobs on your mixer. Bloody hell, man. So imagine if he's saying it's to his level, imagine what he would think of the equipment that pub dudes have to play at. <laughs> the standard situation in the booth is I find it unacceptable because I know I can perform better if I'm comfortable and if I'm in a space where I can operate I can move and look at my records and the monitoring is good and there's no feedback that's one thing I've noticed too wherever I've been the booth monitor never works I don't know why that is maybe because they don't want to have just extra noise but I never have a booth monitor you always having to monitor from the speakers that are on the dance floor which is you know not 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 ideal um so it's the following i wasn't prepared to do a festival on the festival terms i almost i'm almost creating a nightclub situation in terms of sound system which is very true from what i've seen it's very important to me in a way i'm merely working on what i would be working with it's quite simple so i love that about him um where were you, were there any other shortcomings about club or festival dj that you try to address with how you serve houghton he says the following the length of the set times if you set a situation up correctly you'll create an opportunity for a dj to shine the idea of bringing the best out of someone is really really important we all have to do we all have good and bad days but if you make a situation where the dj is comfortable and where they can do their thing they hopefully you can get the best out of them they will perform happily so comfort is one area but the other thing is the length of time you need time to play the conveyor belt situation in festivals is not much fun yeah we're just coming you know one every hour hour and a half they're just freaking rotating them unless you get it right i know um, how to do it now but when i first had the big festival gigs you had to really hit it out of the ground running and get straight on with it and that's not an ideal situation i like to slowly get into it and bring a crowd with you which is true i think that's that's the beauty of a junction two two or junction two as well when we went there last year they did really well to kind of get let the DJs have time to kind of ease into it. Um, every DJ kind of got like a, I think, minimum of two hours for the most part. Uh, the DJs that started in the earlier in the day got, probably got a bit longer. They played a bit slower. It felt like a nice warm up set. It didn't feel as if like your DJ had to come in and just kind of hit out the park on the, hit out of, hit on the ground running as Craig Richards mentioned. And just start playing all your bangers straight away. Um, like you know. I'd imagine like in a quick, like in a quote unquote, eats everything sort of DJ set, right? Where you're just playing the banger straight away and just getting on with it. Um, it's quite nice to have that kind of range so that if it eats everything does come on later, you can then, he can kind of pick up the mood as opposed to just being beaten over the head with four DJs that are playing that similar style. That's quite cool to hear him say that. So yeah, I definitely recommend you check out Houghton. I might check it out myself, although I'm probably going to go Junction 2 again this year. Um, but yeah, really cool interview with uh, Craig Richards. Uh, really interesting, really insightful. Again, I'm a big fan of the Art of DJing um, series that's on Resident Advisor. I think for any up-and-coming DJ, any fan of dance music in general, I think it's something you should really keep an eye on. And, and, and it really gives you an appreciation of the DJs that you follow to see how enthusiastic they are about it. I think this might be one of their longest interviews. He gives very thorough, very in-depth um, answers. He's very considerate. and just seems like someone that's really enjoying himself, especially the older he's becoming. It seems like he's even more in love with electronic music than he was when he first started. Let's definitely check it out. A legend in the London scene, one of Fabric's residents for maybe the longest time, maybe 13 years or so, I think, for the most part. I recommend you check it out. A really cool feature from Resident Advisor. Anyway. That's an hour, isn't it, right? That's an hour, ladies and gentlemen. I've been ranting and raving. Thank you so much for tuning in. As a pleasure, as always. Um, if you want to check out more concerning myself, please check out my website, agassinozingo.com. You'll be able to find it in the show notes description. And if you're watching via YouTube, smash that like button, click subscribe, come back another time. If you're listening via the podcast app, leave me a five-star review. You know how that does. You know how that works. And until then, I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care. Be safe. Enjoy your Friday. Peace.